General Bill Starkey, who began his career in the military 36 years ago as a West Point plebe, who has won countless medals in his service of his country, who has spoken to many presidents and even offered some of them advice, who has been through dark times before, but this, the accident had occurred almost perfectly between shifts. Project Blue's cafeteria had only been lightly populated. Starkey thought, you will spend eternity with your face in a bowl of tomato soup. Billy? Those men who handled Campion's body and Arnett have been through the prelims in Atlanta, and they all tested positive, except for one. Stuart Redman, who's negative so far, but who knows how long that's gonna last. If only Campion hadn't a run. That was sloppy security, Len. Very sloppy. Go on. Arnett's been quarantined and we've isolated at least 16 cases of constantly shifting A prime flu there. On the plus side, as far as the media is concerned, they believe this is an anthrax situation. Thank God for that, at least. What else, Len? We have a Texas Highway Patrolman, Joseph Robert Brentwood, whose cousin owns the gas station where Campion ended up. He dropped by there yesterday morning to tell Hapscomb the health department people were coming and was exposed to A prime, Starkey thought. We picked him up three hours ago, Billy. But in the meantime, he, he'd been off trolling half of East Texas. And God knows how many people he's been in contact with. Christ. 99.4% communicability, Starkey thought. 99.4% excess mortality. On June 18th, five hours after he had talked to his cousin Bill Hapscomb, Joe Bob Brentwood pulled Harry Trent, an insurance man, over for speeding on Highway 40. While Brentwood wrote out the ticket, Trent jokingly tried to sell him a life insurance policy. Dying was the last thing on Joe Bob's mind. A day later, Trent stopped at an East Texas cafe called Babe's Quick Eat for Lunch. Harry felt a little under the weather, but was in a good enough mood to leave the sweet thing that waited on him a big fat tip, a $10 bill that was crawling with death. In the Quick Eats parking lot, Trent stopped to help New Yorker Edward M. Norris, who was on vacation with his family. Trent gave Norris very clear directions to US-21 heading north. He also, unwittingly, served the man and his family their death warrants. That evening, the Norris family stayed in a Eustis, Oklahoma travel court. Ed and his wife, Trish, infected the clerk. Their kids, Marsha, Stanley, and Hector, infected the kids they played with on the travel court's playground. Kids bound for West Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, and Tennessee. Everybody was getting into the act. The next morning, at a doctor's office in Polliston, Oklahoma, poor Hector Norris was glass-eyed with a terrible fever. The Norrises infected no less than 25 people, including a matronly woman, Sarah Bradford, who would go on to pass the disease to her entire bridge club that night. After bridge, Sarah and her brass friend Angela Dupree went out for a quiet drink in a cocktail bar. They rehashed their playing and, simultaneously, managed to infect everyone in the Polliston bar with the disease that would soon be known across the disintegrating country as Captain Trips. The next day, Angela's teenage daughter, Samantha, would go on to infect everybody in the swimming pool at the Polliston YMCA. And so on. Chain letters don't work. Everybody knows that. But this one, the Captain Tripp's chain letter, was working very well indeed. The pyramid, with Charlie Campion at its tip, was being built. All the chickens were coming home to roost. Just roll up your sleeve, Mr. Redman. This won't take a minute. No. It's only your blood pressure. Doctor's orders. If it's doctor's orders, then let me talk to a doctor. I'm only doing my job, Mr. Redman. You don't want to get me in trouble, do you? They had come to Arnett and got him on the afternoon of the 17th. Four army men and a doctor, all of them wearing sidearms, which meant to Stuart that he was in serious trouble. Go back and tell them I won't cooperate. They'll send somebody. Patty Greer was quite upset that you gave her trouble. That's not very nice, Mr. Redman, is it? I want some answers. I want to know where my friends are. I want to know why, if my town's been quarantined, I haven't seen anything about it on that TV in the corner. I simply don't have the authority to tell you anything. I know very little myself. You've been taking my blood. If you want more, you either start giving me answers or you send big men to get it. And no matter how big they are, I'm going to try to rip holes in them germ suits. Mr. Redman, your lack of cooperation may do your country a great disservice. Do you understand that? From where I'm sitting, it's my country that's doing me the disservice. Now get the hell out of here and send someone who can talk to me. Redman's fear was big inside him, like a runaway elephant. It would be 40 more hours before they sent him a man who would answer some of his questions. What's on your mind, Franny? I... I'm pregnant, Daddy. Oh, Franny. For sure? For sure. Well then, you'd better come over here and sit with me. Peter Goldsmith held his daughter for a long time. 
When Franny's tears began to taper off, she asked him, Do you still like me? What? Yes, I still like you fine, Franny. Which made her cry again. But this time, they weren't great brain sobs. When she'd finished the second time, Was it that, Jess? Yes, he said he would marry me, but... Oh, he means well, but two semesters ago, we went to a poetry reading, Daddy, given by a man named Ted Enslin, and the place was packed, and everyone was listening so solemnly, and it struck me as so pretentious, and I... Well, you know me. Franny got the giggles. I did, and Daddy, I couldn't stop. And Jesse was furious with me, and I'm sure he had a right to be mad. It was a childish thing to do, but that's the way I am sometimes, and Jess isn't. And if we got married, you'd be unhappy. I guess I would be, Daddy. Don't let your mother change your mind, then. She'll have plenty to say about all this, about who to blame. And I won't stop her, but I won't be with her. Do you understand that? Franny did. Her father never tried to oppose her mother anymore. She had a cruel tongue, and it could get out of control. I have to tell her, don't I? Peter Goldsmith had faced a choice many years ago. Continued opposition against his wife resulting in divorce or surrender. Yes, but give it a day or two. For good or ill, he'd chosen surrender. They set upon Nick Andrews just around dusk. A quartet of good old boys. Vincent Hogan, Mike Childress, Billy Warner, and the worst of them, Ray Booth. Nick put up the best fight he could, decking one of them and bloodying another's nose. So for that one or two hopeful moments, he thought he might actually win. Then one of them, the leader it seemed like, caught Nick just over the chin, shredded Nick's lower lip with some sort of school ring, and that was pretty much that. Why don't he say anything? Why don't he yell out, Ray? I told you not to use names, and I don't give a damn why he don't yell out. I'm gonna mess him up. Nick caught some of Ray's words. Somehow his wild kick connected with Ray's belly. It was probably the worst thing Nick could have done. Ugh. Hold, hold him. Hold him by the hair. You, you kick me. You're a dirty fighter. Kicks and punches rained down on him. Then, and Nick became a boneless, jittering puppet on a string, flopping around. After a while, in the last fading lights of day, Ray and his pals became only shapes. Easy, Ray. You want to kill him? Dimly, Nick thought he saw light splashing down the road, approaching fast. He felt himself being released. By that point, Mercifully, Nick's consciousness was narrowing down to a pencil beam before, even more eventually, snuffing out completely. Morning, sexy. I made us eggs and bacon. Was her name Maria? Larry couldn't remember. He was hungover and in pain. Oh no, honey, I gotta run. There's uh, someone I gotta see, my, uh, my mother. I'm staying with her and I didn't call last night. That much was true, at least. I thought you were a nice guy. Look, I'm sorry, I have to go. You ain't no nice guy. Any other man that spatula would have missed. But this was Larry, remember? You ain't no nice guy, and I bet you ain't the Larry Underwood that has that record either. Jesus. I hope you rot. I hope you fall in front of a subway train. You ain't no singer. You ain't got no mother. And you ain't no nice guy. Later, seeking refuge, Larry went to the Lux Movie Theater on 42nd Street. A horror movie was playing about a boogeyman who killed horny teenagers in their dreams. I am. I am a nice guy. In one of the rows behind Larry, a man was coughing. When Nick came to, he was lying on a bunk behind bars in the pissant jail run by Sheriff John Baker. When I was a boy, we shot a mountain lion up in the hills and drug it 20 miles back home. What was left of that creature was the sorriest looking sight I ever saw. You, boy, are the second sorriest. It didn't take Baker long to figure out that Nick was deaf and couldn't talk. He could read lips, though. So they came up with a system to communicate. Baker talked. Nick wrote. All right, Nick Andros. What happened to you? Doc Soames and his wife almost ran you down like a woodchuck, boy. You see Rich's dog? Why don't I let you out of there and you can come into my office? The coffee hurt Nick's mouth, but tasted good. I'll tell you what. If you stick around, maybe we can get the guys who did this to you. How many were there? You think you could identify any of them? Even one of them? That's Ray Booth, my brother-in-law. Made perfect sense to Baker. He knew Ray and his goons, as vicious and cowardly as a dog pack. Sheriff Baker was going to have to tell his wife Janie about Booth. She knew her brother was a bad egg, 
but it still probably meant no Jenny loving for Baker this week. Yes, sir. Between this deaf, dumb drifter and the swollen glands that were throbbing under Baker's jaw, it was shaping up to be a wonderful day. I'm Dick Dietz. Deniger said you wouldn't play ball unless someone told you what the score was. What would you like to know? First, I guess I want to know why you're not wearing one of those spacesuits. We have a guinea pig, Geraldo, two rooms over. He's been breathing the same air as you for the last three days. He says you're not catching. Geraldo, huh? Well, what have I got? So far as Deniger and his colleagues have been able to ascertain, you don't have any disease or illness at all. What about the other people I came in here with? I'm sorry, that's classified. Um, how did that fellow Campion get it? That's classified, too. Classified. My guess is that means army. Mr. Redmond, you've disappeared from the face of the earth. If you start knowing too much, the big guys might decide the safest thing would be for you to disappear forever. Can you... Can you tell me how the others are doing at least? Deceased. All the men who were with you at the gas station. And their families as well. All... All of them? Everyone but... What did you do? Mr. Redman, what did you people do? Nothing. On this one, responsibility spreads in so many directions, it's invisible. It was an accident. We're trying to cope with it, but we're not responsible. Not even Campion's responsible. Given the circumstances, I would have run too. When? When do I get out of here? I don't know. It's classified? No, just unknown. You don't seem to have the disease. We want to know why you don't have it. Then we're home free. Ah. Ah. Achoo! 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 Oh my god! Calm down. I was faking. What? Faking? Why? Sorry, Dr. Dietz. That's classified. But go ahead and tell the big guys they can resume their tests on me. That night, Stu slept better than he had since they brought him to Atlanta. He had an extremely vivid dream. He had always dreamed a great deal. His late wife had complained about him thrashing and muttering in his sleep, but he'd never had a dream like this one. He was standing on a country road under a blazing summer sun surrounded by fields of green corn. There was the sound of crows far away. Closer by, someone was playing a hymn on a guitar. This is where I ought to get to, Stu thought in the dream. Yeah, this is the place all right. He half remembered the hymn from his childhood but couldn't place the tune. Then the music stopped and the clouds came out of nowhere and blot out the sun. Stuart became afraid. He felt as if there were something worse than the plague. Something in the corn, and it was watching him. Him, Stu thought. It's him. The man with no face. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God, no. Then Stu woke up and his dream was gone, leaving behind feelings of disquiet, dislocation, and relief. He went to the sink and splashed water on his face. He went to the room's window and looked at the moon. All that corn. Must have been Iowa or Nebraska, maybe northern Kansas. The strange thing was, Stuart had never been to any of those places.